Greetings, I'm Dr. Robert Woods with the Paideia Academy. In this introductory course, we'll be talking about the notion of a liberal arts education, a true liberal arts education rooted in the great books and what that looks like as we pursue authentic learning through the great books, the great ideas, and the great conversation. Let's begin by thinking through the meaning of the term great books. It is a book that has been read by the largest number of persons that has over the centuries had more readers than other books and that have stood the test of time. Now, of course, if you're thinking about this first term, this first description here of great books, you may wonder about the notion of a instant classic or an instant masterpiece. That's a very modern term and a very modern concept. One of the criteria of a great book is that it has been around a while and has been read by different people of different times and has been appreciated and valued accordingly. It is a book that also has the greatest number of alternative, independent, and consistent interpretations. This is important to spend a little bit of time on because some people think that the great books by their very nature breed a kind of relativism. In other words, if everybody reads a great book, say Homer's Iliad, and walk away with their own interpretation of the Iliad, then doesn't that cultivate a spirit of what is good for you may not be good for another person or your interpretation or how you view things are different from how other people view things. Different opinions is not the same thing as relative relativism when it comes to truth. It is a book that has the greatest number of alternative, independent, and here's a key point, consistent interpretations. An interpretation of, say, again, Homer's Iliad cannot be a wise interpretation if it says that Homer's Iliad is about World War II. That makes no sense. But there are some people who might argue that's what it's about. Or Homer's Iliad is really about race, class, and gender struggles. That's really not what Homer's Iliad is about. And there cannot be put forth a consistent interpretation of that work with an ideological frame of that nature. We'll be talking more about that as we make our way through some of these masterpieces. It raises the persistent unanswerable questions. Now, what we mean by unanswerable, and it's in the sense that we will continue to ask, what is it that makes us happy? What does it mean to be a human being? What is the good life? Now, these questions certainly can be answered in the sense that uh, one's religious convictions, um, one's historical understanding can provide answer. But these great books ask these persistent questions. It must be a work of fine art. It is what Matthew Arnold describes as the best that has been written by a human being. Also, it must be a masterpiece of the liberal arts. Now, in this program of study in the Paideia Academy, when we talk about the liberal arts, we use that term rather interchangeably with other terms such as the humanities or um, the studia humanitatis, which developed during the Renaissance period. Or some will even speak about the seven liberal arts, the quadrivium and the trivium. You'll hear quite a bit of that in this program. Additional thoughts on the meaning of the term great books is contemporary significance of the books within their own context. When we read and discuss, say, Augustine's Confessions, Augustine's Confessions had an importance within its own historical context. Great books also are dealing with issues problems or facets of human life that are of major concern to us today as well as at the time in which they were written. This is where we talk about the ongoing relevancy of the great books. In other words, just because these works were written sometimes thousands of years ago in different cultures, very different from our own, 
the truth is the ways in which these works explore these issues, problems, or facets of human existence connect with us rather quickly. Why? Because truth is timeless. Goodness and beauty are also timeless. A little bit more on the meaning of the term great books. Rereadability, that is books intended for the general reader that are worth reading carefully many times or studying over and over again. I've actually lost count of the amount of times that I have read Homer's Odyssey or Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics or Plato's Republic. It's dozens and dozens of times in part and in whole. Dante's Divine Comedy, I could read over and over again because every time it invites deeper, richer understanding. These books are also rereadable for pleasure and profit. In other words, you should delight in reading the great books. Even when you disagree with the author, because of the nature of these works, the depth, complexities, and insights, they offer pleasure and, of course, benefit, intellectual and sometimes spiritual benefit. Additionally, great books demonstrate an extensive relevance to the ideas of the thinking and writing done by the authors chosen, something of significance to say about a large number of the great ideas. In this course of study within the Paideia Academy, we'll talk often about the 102 great ideas that Mortimer Adler and a team of brilliant intellectuals put together. And one may quibble about some of these 102 great ideas. There may be 98 great ideas. There may be 107 great ideas. But these ideas are important, and these great works often exhibit multiple ideas. Let's spend just a few moments about the term liberal education because the truth is, as we look for the meaning of this term, it has been quite a debate over the last several decades in the United States of America. The word liberal does not mean here in contrast with conservative. The word liberal here is not a synonym for progressive. The word liberal here from the Latin liberalis means freedom. This kind of education should liberate us. It frees us from the tyranny of the limited ideas and thoughts of the current moment we live in. Mortimer Adler and others say this about liberal education. It is easy to say what it is not. It is not specialized education. It is not vocation, avocational, professional, or pre-professional training. It is education to make the most of our human powers education for our responsibilities as members of a democratic society, education for freedom. And we'll be talking a great deal about the end of a liberal arts education as we go through your course of study. The best liberal education or liberal learning teaches the student to reflectively engage life. It's not a separation of the mind from the body, or from the heart, from the soul. It's not a separation of objective knowledge versus subjective knowledge. It is a call to reflectively think about what it means to be human. The best liberal education ignites the spark for a life characterized by love of learning. And the best liberal education provides habits, and we'll talk in this program about skills of the mind and the soul for navigating this life toward another. Within the Paideia Academy, we use the word Paideia quite a bit. Paideia from the Greek paos or pedos, the upbringing of a child related to pedagogy and pediatrics. In an extended sense, it is the equivalent of the Latin humanitas from which we get our English word, the humanities signifying the general learning that should be the possession of all human beings. It's also worth noting that in the ancient world and much through early Christianity, paideia was a kind of synonym for not only education, but culture. It is the interplay and the interconnectedness of learning and life between our mind and the culture and the world in which we live. 
In the Paideia approach to learning within the Paideia Academy, you'll notice we stress different ways of approaching knowledge and acquiring information and understanding. Each learning unit will have a short didactic presentation. Didactic presentation is teaching by telling with lectures and responses sometimes, textbooks and other aids that are utilized. Adler and others have argued for decades that the didactic presentation, which by the way is the most common form of teaching in K-12 and colleges, is actually the most fading in nature as it stresses passive recognition of knowledge. Now, is the acquisition of certain data and facts important? It, it certainly is. Will you be called to memorize things within this program? You certainly will be. But it is secondary or elementary or foundational to your learning. It is not the primary way in which a human being truly learns. The next column of the Paideia approach to learning is what's called the intellectual or academic coaching of skills. Through academic tutoring, and that's why we have numerous tutorial sessions offered in every single course, you will be taught to think in a liberal, humane way. You'll be developing skills of listening, speaking, reading, writing, calculating, problem solving, observing, measuring, estimating, exercising reason, and making judgment. These are the kinds of skills that you will be coached within in all of the tutorial sessions related to the readings or the exercises you do within each course. And finally, the third column, which many students have said, once they have been a part of this, it completely transforms the way they enjoy learning. It's what's called conversational learning. This is the humane activity of Mayudic or Socratic questioning, and this is key, active participation of all students. It's more permanent in nature as it stresses active, usable understanding of the material that's being covered. Now, in this first course, and this is going to be rather common within the quarter uh, context of the Paideia program, you see you have nine weeks. Week one in this course is a discussion of Plato's Apology. Students will read this work. There will be tutorial sessions related to this work and a conversational session. And then same goes on. Week two, Plato's Republic, just books one and two. There will be a tutorial session where certain skills are developed in looking at and discussing this work. And then there'll be a robust, lively, Socratic conversation about Plato's Republic books one and two. We do the same thing for Sophocles' Oedipus the King and the play Antigone, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, just book one, Aristotle's Politics, book one. There will be selections from Plutarch's The Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans. And with all of our humane courses and our humane studies, you will have a reading from scripture, from sacred scripture. Uh, in this particular course, we will read the book of Job and discuss it in week seven. And then in week eight, we look at Augustine's Confessions, books one through eight. And then week nine is when you have either a final exam will be a written, or in our case, you will type it and you'll submit it that way or a project. It depends on what your instructor will call for in each course. But in this course, it'll be a final exam uh, with a couple of questions weaving together some of the readings. Well, I'm looking forward to working with each of you in this course, and I am confident that you will find the Paideia approach within the Paideia Academy is going to be wonderful, delightful, awe-inspiring, and intellectually affirming. Look forward to seeing you in class.